In 1955, Peter, my father, quit the Navy. At the time, he had a plum job as a frigate captain and his friends were advising him to stay on to get his pension. Ignoring them, he resigned and bought Salmo, a 25-foot virtue-class yacht with the intention of sailing around the world. He believed life in the Navy, although fun and secure, was becoming too predictable. Preparing Salmo, he removed the engine as an unnecessary complication and added a water tank and lockers in its place. He took only a chronometer, sextant and limited charts for navigation. There were no electronics, no radio. During this work he met Jill and, once launched, took her for a sail from the Solent to New Haven, where she left to go back to work, and he continued on up the North Sea to Inverness, the Caledonian Canal, and then to Helensboro. Jill subsequently joined him for a shakedown cruise, along with a potential crew member for the transatlantic crossing. Potential crew left prematurely, and shortly after, Peter proposed to Jill in a gale off Tarbot, and they became engaged. They telephoned their family with the news from the telephone box at Colin Drive. With no other crew materialising, Peter decided it was simplest to just sail single-handed across the Atlantic before the season became too late, fly home, get married, and then ship back out to Salmo with Jill to continue with the voyage. And this is what they did. Here we see Salmo being launched for the first time in Peter's ownership at the Hailing Island Yacht Station. She leaked like a sieve initially, but after a few days she took up and she never leaked again. This might be Creole at Nicholson Schooner. He sailed up the North Sea largely using the back of the AA Members Handbook for navigation, went through the Caledonian Canal and then subsequently on to Helensborough. Having no engine, she was pulled through parts of the canal. Bill and Joan Ridley who had hosted him whilst fitting her out and introduced him to Jill, had joined him in Inverness for a few days. Uh, this is his sister Audrey at Ward's Farm, Garter Harm, painting tins of provisions. And Jock, his brother, helping him to load stores at Helensboro. The familiar outline of Elsa Craig. Sailing along nicely. Climbing the mast at sea with a big cine camera in one hand. He steered a lot using tiller lines from the companionway. He had his own patent downwind sail, uh, a flat cut spinnaker flown from a spar lashed across the pulpit. A passing ship which wouldn't come close enough for him to f throw mail to. And fishermen off the coast of Labrador, this is him arriving on the other side. Arriving at his first port across the Atlantic, he thought it was called Wise Man's Hole, but it turned out not to have been called that for 50 years, now going by the name of Red Bay. A beautiful sheltered anchorage where the local people made him welcome and he dispatched mail and sent a telegram. Trade was by coastal steamer. Washing and salting cod, Next he went to Ramuski and became a bit of a news story, managing to sell some interviews to newspapers. He was befriended by several people who were very generous with their help. On the way up the St Lawrence he went to a ball at Quebec with a family called Price, for which, luckily, he'd brought a dinner jacket, and then on to Montreal for the winter, where he left Salmo to fly home to get married. Now married, Peter and Jill returned by steamer and were loaned a holiday house at a ski resort at Saint Sauveur by the Coristines and spent the winter trying to raise money by writing or selling interviews. They also skied and worked on Salmo. Money was a constant worry in those days. You couldn't take money out of the country, so running costs had to be raised on the way. 
Jill managed to sell a weekly journal to Weekend magazine, which was their most regular source of income on their voyaging. Launching in the spring and Jill's first appearance on the film. Sailing down the St Lawrence back out towards the Atlantic, with various stops for stores and excursions. They had initially been intending to take Salmo across to the Pacific overland, which was why Peter had sailed so far west up the St Lawrence, but this proved impractical, so they just carried on under sail. loading some precious stores. Canada in spring is cold, and this is a scene showing some of the layers that Jill would put on before going on watch. Her first experience of night solo watchkeeping had been upwind in a narrow channel on the river with background lights obscuring navigation lights and ships, and it must have been completely nerve-wracking for her, but she did manage okay. Initially, the river was ice-free, but as they got out into more open water, they encountered ice. I still have these nylon mugs. Indeed, I took one on my Atlantic voyage on Freya. Very practical presents from Blondie Hasler to Peter. They're huge and stable. They found the gut of Canzo blocked by ice, had a horrible couple of nights around it, sometimes becalmed and unable to steer, and eventually managed to retreat for a day or two to Pictou before trying again more successfully. This saved them a 250 mile round trip around the north end of Nova Scotia.
Now this is them docking at Pic 2 under sail. Remember they had no engine so every time they came alongside it was always under sail. Some shots from the Prout collapsible dinghy, their tender, in mid-ocean. Peter bringing in some washing, only for the camera. He'd have considered that Jill's part of ship, I think. Well, once heading south towards New York, leaving Nova Scotia astern, a Coast Guard ship thought that they were lost and tried to direct them north again but they convinced them that they knew where they were going. Their approach to Newport through Nantucket Sound was tricky, with fog and no charts. They resorted to going close to buoys to try to identify them, but finding marks like number seven pretty unhelpful. In New York, Ratsy and Lapthorn, the sailmakers, kindly allowed them to use the sail loft to patch up sails. Again, they were treated most hospitably by everybody. Sailing down the Hudson River, past Manhattan Island, and then departing from the US. I think that this was a little joke. Peter was going to work with Jock, his brother, a farmer on return to Scotland, and was reading about various aspects of it. They're now in warmer waters and enjoying a lunch. The first port of call after New York was Kingston, Jamaica. They loved it. Lots of friendly locals. The 
seem to be happy girls everywhere who seem to spend all their time dancing and singing and laughing. I can't believe how Jill managed to keep so many outfits looking so good. This is the Prout, a collapsible tender and occasional mid-ocean camera platform. They'd had the Rollocks nicked by small boys earlier, so they had to paddle the prowls. They used to cool off swimming. Peter was at home in the water, having been a swimmer canoeist with the Navy during the war. They're going along at quite a speed here, but he's quite happy. Apart from Jamaica, they only stopped at Inagua in the Caribbean before arriving at Port Antonio at the Panama Canal. Without an engine, they couldn't transit the canal on their own. They were towed through by a family group, the Hathaways, who had become their friends and were cruising on Seafarer, a much bigger boat. In a yacht, the canal is quite alarming. It's obviously built for ships and everything is huge, including the turbulence as the locks fill. They were lucky as they were on the outside. Seafarer risked any bashing that may have occurred. Now, the railway engine is called a mule and is what pulls the ships from lock to lock. On the far side of the canal, they were keen to paint Salmo's bottom with fresh anti-fouling to protect her from gribble or teredo worms, a feature of the Pacific. They did this, drying out and falling over during a thunderstorm on consecutive tides on the Pacific side of the canal. They had a few days of light winds, which is typical of the area, before picking up the trades. En route to the Galapagos, they crossed the line, the equator, and Jill was initiated into Neptune's court. Peter wrote a great bit of verse for this. It was nearly a disaster because as Jill was being dunked over the stern, Peter lost his footing and they both nearly fell overboard. They found the wildlife astonishing in the Galapagos, with Daddy saying, never in my life had I seen so many birds and beasts and fishes all at one time before, and none of them seemed to care a damn about us. Even the turtles hardly bothered to swim out of the way. They first stopped at Barrington Island, 
having decided against going to Wreck Bay, downwind to clear in. They managed to charm the authorities on a subsequent arrival at Wreck Bay. In this scene they weren't sure what would happen but were quite happy with the results which they thought made good footage. Jill managed to get chased in the water by an irritated sea lion but it wasn't captured on the film. A flightless cormorant. A post office bay on Floriana was the next port of call, and mail was picked up and dropped off at the letterbox. They then walked to the Whitmers with mail that they'd found at the post box for them. This was a far harder walk in the heat of the day than expected, but they had a wonderful welcome at the Whitmers and spent a couple of days being entertained by them and their family. blue-footed booby, relative of our gannets. Peter was perhaps lucky not to lose an eye to it. Uh, Galapagos penguins. Without large-scale charts of any of the islands, they spent a long time studying pilot books before arriving anywhere, and Pitcairn, 2,500 miles away, was their next destination. 24 days sailing took them there. It is out of the way and consequently seldom visited, which made it much more attractive to them. The anchorage is terrible, but they were shown the best spot and taken ashore through the surf in one of the island's boats. The islanders made souvenirs for the passengers on the cruise liners. I'm not quite sure how a chimp came to be there. With the weather worsening, Peter goes out to Salmo again and spends 24 hours sailing whilst the weather improves, leaving Jill behind to enjoy some island life.
Here, one of the big boats is being launched to go to a cruise liner for some trade. This scene is Jill bending on the staysail and then dowsing the Genoa and then hoisting the, the staysail as the wind increases. And this is Peter putting a reef in the mainsail. They had some pretty strong winds here and are now seen with a trysail and storm jib and Jill steering from the companionway. From Pitcairn they were heading to Mangareva but having arrived they weren't permitted entry there and were only allowed to top up with water and a couple of coconuts which they found profoundly disappointing. The officials wanted them to go to Tahiti to clear in, 800 miles away. From Mangareva, they went to Rapa, a beautiful mountainous volcanic island where they had a good welcome with several locals coming aboard for hours and enjoying a couple of their cigarettes from them before being ushered off by the chief. Here, they're going to meet the Count, who lived on the island but was ill with beriberi at the time. He appeared to be a genuine French Count who decided he liked life on the island and was living here permanently. This is a new church being built. The two cigarette hospitality that they had provided to the locals on the way in was returned with interest before their departure. They found presents of chickens, fruit, vegetables, fish, mutton and so on left aboard for them. 
Navigation had become a team event, with Jill noting the times and altitudes as Peter shot the sun. Jill did learn to navigate too, but it was mostly Peter. He boasted that he could teach a child enough about navigation in an hour to successfully plot a position. Uh, Jill rather blew this theory out of the water. Tahiti, described as Earth's last paradise, and here they are, moored stern to at Papiete, after being towed in by the pilot boat. Rats on the quay, some of whom came aboard and frightened some stewardesses from a cruise ship that they were being entertained in the hopes of a reciprocal visit to the ship. They managed their cruise ship visit later that night. A surf break at the western end of Papiete Lagoon, with deep water to the right and Maria in the background. I used to try surfing this wave when in Tahiti on Blue Leopard, never particularly successfully. A few more shots of Salmo from the Prout. and Peter landing a tuna. And Jill are going ashore. They spent a few months in Tahiti and the Society Islands and loving it. They had a good Christmas, with Peter delighted with his present of an umbrella, which was very well used, and Jill even happier with a quantity of material from a small shop that was run up into a dress at a Chinese tailor the following day in time for a party that they had aboard for their friends. Sometime after Christmas, it turned out that Jill was expecting their first child. They wanted her to be born in the UK. Tahiti is a long way from anywhere. After some thinking, they decided to sail back across the Pacific to Los Angeles. This is not only a long way, nearly 4,000 miles, but against the winds and currents, and across the equator and the doldrums. I suspect that the challenge of it appealed to them too. They set off, stopping at the Marquesas on the way. The final leg was made worse by a lack of food and alcohol, and they had inadvertently forgotten to top up their paraffin at the Marquesas and ran low, having to devise a method of heating, heating previously cooked food with a mess in a biscuit tin. They had ample water, rice and spaghetti, however, and after a tedious long upwind passage, arrived in Los Angeles, having spent 46 days at sea. This is footage shot subsequent to arrival, with the benefit of studio lighting and a cameraman. Endless shots of the meeting spaghetti for the camera. It was a weekend as they arrived in Los Angeles 
and without charts they weren't sure where to go. They followed the biggest stream of yachts returning home on a Sunday evening. They were directed to the immigration pier where they were met by the port health doctor. With the typical American friendliness and hospitality he took them home for a wash, bath and family meal and I doubt whether that evening could have been improved upon for them. The arrival formalities were completed the following morning. This is them berthing under sail in Los Angeles with the Hathaways from Seafarer who towed them through the Panama Canal on hand to meet them. Jill in the only clothes that were still fitting which he'd made en route to Los Angeles out of other clothes no longer of use. They managed to sell their film to Jack Douglas for his series Bold Journey and this netted them $1200. Daddy getting made up which he hated although he looks quite happy here. Salma was cleaned, repainted and sold too, enabling them to return to the UK in time for Gail, my sister, to be born in Surrey. This is Jack Douglas. Salma is still in California. This is her in August 2021. 